Thank you for joining us for another live Action for Happiness event. Today's theme is Happier Life Lessons with Simon Mundy, and we're going to be talking about all kinds of fantastic stuff around flow, well-being, uh, and sort of practical ways that we can be happier ourselves and bring some of that to the world. Uh, so Simon, thank you so much for being here. Really looking forward to our conversation. Huge fan of your work. Oh, what a lovely thing to say, Mark. I'm a huge fan of your work too. I think Action for Happiness is a beautiful intention. So it's a pleasure and a privilege. Thank you so much. And folks, it's lovely to see you joining us from all around the world um, and welcoming each other in the chat. This is different to a live event with a, uh, you know, watching a, a lecture or um, listening to a podcast later. You are now part of something as a community. This is an Action for Happiness community event that we're all part of. So as well as the conversation that Simon and I are going to have together, you can all be part of that by your friendly, supportive comments in the chat. But also, Simon's going to share some interactive things that we can put into practice, not only in our lives later, but also as part of uh, the event today. So welcome if it's your first time. And if you're already part of this community, it's lovely to see you here um, again. Simon, I'd love to dive straight into this topic about, you know, life lessons, which, of course, is also the title of your great podcast. Um, but maybe you could, for anyone who's not so familiar with you and your background, give us a very quick thumbnail intro about you, maybe not only your professional interest in this, but also personally, what's brought you to this topic? Sure. So I think the best place to start would be when I joined the BBC, which was back in 2010. So I'm probably best known for broadcasting uh, on radio and television. <clears throat> and in 2010, I was hired as a news reporter for Radio One, which was very exciting. I sort of thought I'd made it. And I was running around doing news stories for those first six months. And then that summer, they wanted someone to be their sports presenter. And although I I've never been a football fan, which makes me very unusual for a sports reporter. Uh, I've always been a huge tennis fanatic. And so I thought, OK, this will be a lot of fun. And I took the job in 2010 and again was just over the moon. I thought it was a job that was too good for me, really. And it was an amazing period to do that job because we had a home Olympics in 2012 and Paralympics. We had Andy Murray winning Wimbledon, the men's singles for the first time, a Brit winning that for 77 years then the football world cup in brazil in 2014 the sort of spiritual home of football so it was this amazing time and yet for me over time i found that it was a little bit shallow i would leave broadcasting i'd be talking about results and tactics and the score and just feeling this was barely touching the surface because there's old, that old saying of sport as a metaphor for life and so increasingly i wanted to to explore that now, <clears throat> you said not just professionally, in it, full, full disclosure, alongside that was a long-standing, I would say, self-exploration uh, born of suffering. I, um, I had struggled with anxiety, uh, particularly in my 20s. I felt like there was a certain need to fix myself. Um, there were just, you know, a sense of not being enough, those kind of things, very typical Things And I think suffering can be a real blessing because it, it propels you to seek answers. And so I was seeking answers initially through the classic things of self-improvement and all that kind of jazz. <clears throat> and actually where it led me uh, was a, a destination, which is, I would say, where I'm now at and where what my book's about and really what my podcast and my talks and stuff tend to be about. That is something I never could have predicted or foreseen at the start. And I'm now grateful for that suffering. But around this time of where I was questioning my my sports uh, reporting, I was also wondering, you know, how can I talk more about this subject that I'm interested in, the well-being, the um, psychological well-being, happiness, meaning, purpose, um, all those kind of things. And I had no idea how that would happen. And then um, in about 2016, I, I started to pitch the idea of a podcast to the BBC where I was like, Look, I want to talk about sport in a way that makes it interesting and relevant to people who aren't interested in sport. Cause there's an old saying sport is a metaphor for life. Let's talk about it in that way. So it's not just for the people who like football. One of the bosses liked it, commissioned me to uh, launch this podcast in 2018. 
And I've been doing it since then. And then it's evolved. I got approached about writing a book about it. And uh, yeah, now it's taken off in the direction. It's not just sport, hence the name Life Lessons. I've spoken to many of your former guests and formed this, I would say, philosophy, drawing particularly from examples from sport, but also so many of the other people uh, I've looked at about you know, how we find peace and happiness within, but also empathy, kindness and, con and contentment and uh, all those nice things, love even outside. And that's where I would say I've arrived at. So it's been you know, a, a joint professional and personal thing. They say research is me search. And that certainly was the case with me. Yeah. And I would say that I, I, I'm very grateful to you, Simon, because I, I'm a sport lover myself, but also I've been on a similar journey of exploration. And what I think you've done really beautifully in those conversations is use, uh, you know, a topic like sport, which I have a lot of passion for, but actually bring out some really rich and quite deep things. So I, I, I was worried initially that this might be quite superficial sort of, you know, uh you know we can be the best etc the sort of sport classic sporting metaphors but what you've done i think and what i hope we'll hopefully do together in this conversation is get into some quite deep profound questions about life so i, I really uh, appreciate this book champion thinking um which at first glance sounds like it might be just about the conventional view of success but what you very rapidly do is challenge these notions of what success really means and i i guess one of the key themes that comes up is this hang up we have in our lives about this i think what you call the i'll be happy when you know the various versions of that we have i'll be happy when i get the job when i have a perfect relationship when i dot 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 do you want to say a bit more about that what that was for you but also what you think that is for us collectively yes i i, I bracket this under success evangelism mm. this idea that you know success is synonymous with happiness and fulfillment and all those kind of things. And I could understand with the title champion thinking why you might think it falls into that kind of genre, but actually I'm trying to do the absolute opposite of that. I want to start at this challenge, this idea that it's about becoming in the future. And so, as you say, there's this idea that is so pervasive. I'll be happy when X happens. Now in life that can be, uh, I'll be happy when I get the house when I get the relationship, when I get the job, when I get the promotion, when I get the retirement. I mean, the, the list, when I go to the party, the list is endless. But I think as we get older in particular, we realize that nothing out there can actually give us that sense of lasting fulfillment and contentment that we really want in there, which is what we want from all of those things. You know, relationship, uh, is a good example, you know, we all fall in love, but then before long, the challenges start asserting themselves. That's inevitable. Um, and so, you know, that's life. And then in sport, I would say this is just heightened because we it's, it's, it's higher profile. But if you look at things like what is it that people are chasing? Well, they're chasing things like a World Cup win. They're chasing an Olympic gold medal. They're chasing world records. It's the same thing. It's just heightened. But there are yeah. so many people um, in, in life, but in sport as well, who've reached the top of their proverbial Everest only to be left with a feeling of emptiness and, un and feel unfulfilled. So we can therefore say, Mark, I'll shut up any second now. We can therefore say that definitively success is not synonymous with happiness and fulfillment. So I, I, I think this is such an important message and, I, and I, I'm looking forward to, I know there's one particular example of Johnny Wilkinson, which really resonated with me, um, exemplifying what you've just said. But I wonder before we go into the, so, so what, um, what's, what's a more healthy way of thinking about it? Let, let, let's maybe turn to a, the community for a moment because I, I have a feeling, despite me having sort of you know, worked in this area for 13 years, I still have various I'll be happy whens going on in my head now. You know, I, it's hard to let go of some. Why don't we be honest with ourselves for a moment? Um, what's your I'll be happy when dot 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 right now? Wherever you are right now in the world listening to this, what's one of the stories you're telling yourself about like I'll be happy when I get to the end of this week, when my mum's feeling better, what, you know, whatever it might be. If you want to share a few words in the chat, let's just let's just listen to each other for a moment and see what's going on in our lives. So I'll be happy when I'll read these out. I've lost weight. I have more money. I, when I retire, when I feel physically better, when I change my job, when I have my yard organized, when I have housing stability, when I find inner peace, when I have a better financial situation, when I book my holiday, when my anxiety is gone, 
exercised regularly, decluttered, when my kids are settled, when I'm free, when I'm traveling, when I immigrate, when I have my own space, when I'm debt free, when I graduate, and and the list continues. So what I'm feeling really affected by that, actually, Simon, because it's, it's, it's some of the things you mentioned, and it's a whole lot more as well. How do you feel as you see that list of real lives flying past there? Well, it's a, it's a universal affliction, isn't it? Um, and we are conditioned this way to think, you know, it's about becoming. If you think about it, when we go to school, it's junior school, and then we go, oh, we're, we're getting ready for, for high school, and then we're getting ready for exams, and the becoming is the, we're going to be arriving soon, and then we're going to university. The arriving's coming, and then it's into the job and the promotion, and you know, but we never arrive. The horizon always stays at a distance. So I think this is a trap that can really, you know, keep you stuck in, on the hamster wheel um forever you know and then it goes on to retirement and even on to legacy oh I'll, I'll be happy when i've got a legacy after i've died um and so i think this is you know there's so many so many people are putting so many different things in but i think this is something that impacts absolutely everybody but i do think just to add quickly mark you said oh i still do this after all these years i don't in some ways i think it's unavoidable. The mind does this. This is what the mind does. And it's about recognizing that and noticing there is another um, way, if you like. So what I love about the sport thing in this case is that we all have our little mini versions of this, our own mini conquest. And yet the, the extreme example of this is I'll be happy when I become the best in the world. And, and so I thought um, I've heard you talk before about the Johnny Wilkinson example. Do you want to maybe talk us through that and why that perhaps reminds us that this is a, a failed ambition for all of us. Well, Johnny is a fantastic example of this because he is, I think, someone who set the loftiest goals possible. So when he was about seven years old, he had two goals. One was to win the World Cup and the other was to be the best in the world. So you can't get much bigger than that within a specific field. And at the age of 24, he achieved both when he famously kicked the winning drop goal to secure England the Rugby World Cup. And it follows then, according to the, this cultural belief that success is a synonymous with happiness and fulfillment, that he would then be ecstatic and it would last. But he found that that was not the case. He had obviously a brief moment of joy when the tournament was over. But the very next day, he said he'd never felt as empty. Wow. And it was, yeah, it was this recognition of, oh my God, I've been putting all my eggs in this basket. I've been working so hard and Johnny did work incredibly hard to achieve this goal in the belief, conscious or otherwise, that when I achieve it, then I will be happy and kind of set for life. Only it didn't work out that way for him. Now, I would say that's just a heightened version of what we all go through. And he told me he was felt lucky that he experienced it at such a young age. but. The trap is the mind then comes back up and goes, OK, well, you're not happy because you need to do it again. And that's where this kind of, oh, I need more, 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 more. You know, there's never enough. That sense can come in. And that, that's another sort of mind trap that you can come into. But I think actually for Johnny was an interesting one. A, a seed was sown at that point that didn't blossom for many years. He, he had a very well publicized mental health difficulties after that. But um, you know, in time, it did force him to have a rethink that actually, is there anything out there, objective, in experience, whether it be the tournament, the job, the relationship, et cetera, that can give me what I really want, which is lasting contentment and full, fulfillment inside? And he came to the conclusion, no. And so he did a reverse 180. And, and I, find it, I find this fascinating. But ironically, the seed for that 180 was also sown on that night in Australia, in Sydney, in November 2003, when he experienced flow. Yes, and I, so I was, uh, I'm looking forward to hearing you introduce us to flow because it's a word that gets used a lot, both in sporting and psychological context. And I think people have sort of slightly different interpretations of it, but just to put it in context, I love, uh, alongside all this list of people in the chat talking about, I'll be happy when, I'll be happy when, someone called Grace just said, I'm happy now. And to Great. me, that was like a, that's a, I'm in that's the moment, it, right? this moment here is precious. And in some ways, that's what flow is, isn't it? Tell, tell us about flow, Simon. Yes. So, um, so flow is 
uh, state, you could say, where we perform and feel at our best. Now, it's that we're all familiar with it to varying degrees, and it is somewhat on a spectrum. We have that sense of having a conversation and you look at the clock and it's, oh my gosh, have we been talking for an hour? It only feels like 10 minutes. Conversely, anyone who has kids and has been on a long car journey and then in their, they're in the back going, are we there yet? Are we there yet? That's the opposite. So flow is that, is that when, when everything is just effortless and things are flowing and we are invariably perform and feel at the best. So the interesting thing about flow, and there's been a lot of research done about it by a guy called Czech Zemnihai. I can never pronounce his first name, but um, the interesting thing about flow compared to success, we've already established that success is not definitively fulfilling. You can often have success and be left with a sense of emptiness or relief or things like that. So success is not always enjoyable. Flow is inherently enjoyable. You can't be in flow and not enjoy it. So that's a really important thing. But there are certain, there are a couple of characteristics about flow that are particularly interesting and really relevant. And, it, and actually, if you dig into them, they have pretty profound implications. Gardening, Melanie. Yes, absolutely. The portals into flow are vast. And I, I can talk a little bit about this, actually. For my wife, it's piano. For me, it's playing tennis, watching tennis, conversation, reading. Adrian Childs told me it was ironing. The portals are yeah, so vast. it's cycling, but there um, we go. Is, it, is one of the common themes something to do with that loss of sense of time? Is that one of the things? So we've got two things. One is a distortion of time. Okay. Right. Um, and so if you think about it, we spend most of our time in psychological time travel, thinking about the past. Oh, this happened. Regret. Oh, I shouldn't have done that. What about that? Or this is coming up. I'm thinking about that. So we're always zip zap, you know, flying into the past and future in our mind. And the past and future only exists in our mind. We only ever actually experience the now, experience this moment, but thought takes us into the future and takes us into the past. We never actually experience the past or the future. It's always now. So that's an important thing. But when time distorts, so as I said, time can to narrow right down, we are utterly present, which means that thoughts about the past drop away. And if thoughts about the past drop away, so does our identity. So if you think about, you know, most people's identity, they'll identify with things like what they do for a job, their beliefs, their tribal affiliations, you know, their country, their religion, whatever it may be, um, their knowledge, their status, all these things. And they only know that, any of those things, because of what's happened to them in the past, their history, their story of me. Whereas if you're absolutely focused on this moment and you have no thoughts about the past, your identity cannot stand. It can only stand in reference to the past. So your identity goes. So they also talk about, as well as a distortion of time, that time narrowing right down to just this moment. Also, you're not thinking about the future. So you're not, it's not about becoming. It's not about becoming something at some point in the future. It's about being, not becoming, being. But then also, because your identity goes, that sense of self disappears. So this me, we all have that me that basically we filter life through. What does this mean for me? Am I going to enjoy this? What, um, you know, Is that the ego, Simon? Is that the the, the ego, yes. Yeah. It's who, who we think we are. It's our psychological identity. It, basically, it's a cluster of thoughts, perhaps with some feelings, that we tend to think is defines who we are. If, and you only have to look at people's social media bios to see that I'm this, I'm that, I'm this, I'm that, I'm this, I'm that. Well, in flow, none of that's none of that's relevant. If you stop someone in the middle of flow, in the moment of flow, they would not be thinking about any of those things. The only thing they'd be thinking is, is well, they wouldn't be thinking, actually. They're just that aware and present. That's all they would say. And if you listen to some of the people I've spoken to. So in the book, I detail so many of these. And there's a really recurring theme in the way they describe it. So Johnny Wilkinson, when he kicked the winning drop goal in 2003, he said it was this, it was this transcendent moment where he could see the action happening and he was so immersed in it, but it was is it, it was happening to him. So he said he could feel Matt Dawson passing him the ball. He could feel it hitting his hands. He sensed his leg going back and kicking the ball and it going over the post. But he said, but it wasn't me kicking it. It was a knowing of it. Right. So how can that be? No me and yet a knowing of it. So we'll come back to that one. Another one is Frankie Dottori. 
his most famous moment, he ran seven winners. He rode seven winners, the Magnificent Seven, it was called, in 1996. And on the last one, which was this no hoper, he rode the winner and he said it was like I was riding. It was like I was there, but I wasn't there. Similarly, Damon Hill, he in his fam best ever drive when he beat Michael Schumacher in a very famous race in Suzuki, he was like it was like something else was driving the car. Emma Raducanu, when she won the U.S. Open, she was said um, she spoke about my body was just acting. I was so present, my body was just acting. It wasn't me; it was just my body doing it on its own. But this isn't just sport. I spoke with Michael Ball on Radio Two about this, and he told me a, an anecdote about Laurence Olivier during one of his, his best ever performances. And they went backstage afterwards and he was in tears. And he was like, because why are you crying, Lawrence? And he said, because I don't know how I did it. It just happened. So there's this sense in all of these stories when we have flow of, of there being an awareness of it, but that this sense of me, the ego, the self-concept, who we believe ourselves to be, the, the, the voice in our head is not present. So that begs the question then, if this sense of self, this me, can disappear, then how real is it? And so when that sense of self drops away, what is left? Well, the background, so how do we get there? How to? We'll come to that, I promise you, Cassandra. Um, the, so the, when the sense of self disappears and when we're so present, then what happens is the background awareness, this sort of aware presence that is there prior to thoughts, prior to feelings, is allowed to shine and it has it's inherently joyful it's inherently peaceful it's also it's where intelligence and inspiration comes from and it's allowed to shine and then what people tend to do is they wrongly associate it with the activity itself so it's oh it's the ironing it's the gardening now these are portals into it but what we experience in those moments when our sense of self goes is the same thing. It's this background awareness lying behind the thoughts and the feelings that oh, is allowed so to shine. I, can I just see if I've understood this right? So this idea that we can be actually being a human being uh, rather than sort of worrying about uh, what we're, uh, sorry, well, uh, worrying about who we were, and who we're going to be and so on. Actually, one way of experiencing that might be in your gardening or your sport, but actually the principle here of like, I'm just in this sort of you almost like non-identifying state of just awareness that's something that in theory we could cultivate and find in in any aspect of our life or other times not just when we're kicking a drop goal or doing the gardening is that is it is it are you saying that it's a way of experiencing something that we could have more of in our lives i would say that it it is our experience at all times we just don't mm. recognize it so i would say this is always happening we just don't recognize it Right. Um, uh, so, I mean, I, I can talk a little bit about the, the how then, if that, that might that might help um, a little bit here. So how I found my way into this, it, as I said, it came from suffering. Um, and a lot of people will be or hopefully will be aware of acceptance and commitment therapy act, which I find to be really uh, an interesting and useful modality created by Stephen Hayes. Anyway, and when I was in my mid-20s, I had really bad insomnia. And I had these thoughts going on in my head. I'd go to bed. Oh, I'm not going to sleep tonight. Tomorrow is going to be awful, etc. And I would try and think my way out of anxiety. And I'd try and wrestle with these thoughts. I'd be having a conversation in my head. I'm not going to sleep tonight. Oh, you might. Essentially not realizing I was on both sides of the conversation. Uh, or I would try and push these thoughts away. I was sort of resisting them. So I was either identifying with them or resisting them. And I was fortunate in that I met a guy called Dr. Guy Meadows. I had one session with him and he introduced me to the world of acceptance and commitment therapy. And he said one sentence that was utterly transformative. And he said, it's important to distinguish between, on the one hand, the thinking mind, we're all familiar with that. It's the one that says, I'm not gonna sleep tonight. So it's making judgments, it's making comparisons, it's taking us into the future, into the past. It's telling us who we are. It's, a, it's the basis of our identity. But then there's also the aware mind. And this was a, a revelation to me. It was like I was slapped around the face. I was like, oh my gosh, it's so obvious. And yet I've completely missed this. I've been so locked in this prison of thoughts and the thinking mind. I've completely overlooked the fact that there is something that is aware of the thinking mind. 
And so in ACT, they talk about diffusion techniques. And this was really powerful for me. So he said, okay, when you go to sleep at night or when you go to bed, you're going to have these thoughts come up. Uh, Dr. Guy Meadows is his name. Uh, when, when you're going to have these thoughts that come up, I'm not going to sleep at night. I'm not going to sleep tonight. Tomorrow is going to be awful. They were two pretty typical ones for me. Rather than getting into a dialogue with them or trying to resist them, what I would do is I would go, I'd notice the thought. So that's part one. There's an element of mindfulness to that. Mm. And then part two is you add a diffusion technique or a diffusion prefix. And the diffusion prefix can just be, I'm aware of the thought, X. So I'm not going to sleep tonight becomes, oh, hang on, you notice it. I'm aware of the thought, I'm not going to sleep tonight. And then what happens is, having been previously fused with the thought, I was the thought, I'm not going to sleep tonight. Or it was a fact. Suddenly, I'm aware of the thought, I'm not going to sleep tonight. Bing, there's a little bit of space. There's me aware of this thought, I'm not going to sleep tonight. Like, oh, my goodness. So I don't have to identify with it. I don't have to resist it because of what resist persists. I can just observe it. And in observing it, there's nothing to stop it just sort of passing on by. As we know, thoughts come and go all the time. And if anyone thinks that they can choose their thoughts, just try stop thinking for 20 seconds and see how you get on. Or just think beautiful thoughts for the rest of the night. We can't do it. But if you bring in this diffusion technique, I'm aware of the thoughts then you stop wrestling with the thoughts and they can kind of unwind on their own. But then that begs the question, okay, so that means I'm not my thoughts. I'm not my thoughts. I'm aware of my just thoughts. Just before we go into the, what it means, just to help recap this, because I think it's such an important point, Simon. So uh, in, I, I actually find this, I mean, I, I remember your conversation with Guy Meadows when you had it in the podcast and finding that, again, equally profound. And I think I found it even more helpful for thoughts that are what ones that we tend to get caught up with our identity, like I'm anxious or yes. I'm cross, you know, and it, it, instead of being I am a, a, anxious is, is me, it's I'm aware that I'm feeling anxious or I'm aware yep. of the thought that I'm anxious right now. And that was just Absolutely. that helped diffuse not only the thought, but actually the kind of embodiment feeling. of that thought, the feeling of anxiety. Yeah. So I, um, 100 percent. Yeah. I think that that ability to sort of say, this is not me, this is a thing that I'm noticing is so, like, as you say, that's so applicable, whether you're at work, whether you're lying in bed, whether you're in the middle of an argument, whether you're whatever it might be happening in your life. It's sort of mindfulness, but it's kind of mindfulness plus creating space in a way. Is that is that a good way of thinking about it? I would say this diffusion technique is a form of mindfulness. It's like portable mindfulness. You don't need to sit down. Um, you don't need to, you know, do it. You can do it at any moment and you can do it with any thought, by the way. It doesn't have to just be negative thought. You can be at any time you think, oh, I'm special. Oh, I'm aware of the thought. I'm special. Let that go as well. You can just let thoughts go all the time. And as you say, with feelings, I remember at London 2012, um, I was super Saturday. I was doing a live broadcast for Five Live and I had that anxiety in my stomach and I tried to get rid of it. And it grew and grew and I was catastrophizing my mind. When I learned more about this, I learned to do exactly what you just spoken about then. I would be on in the wings of a TV live broadcast, same feeling come up, but instead of, oh no, here it is, or I want to get rid of it, anything like that. Oh, I'm aware of this sensation. I'm interested in it. And then there's no resistance and it would dissipate. And it could even alchemize from anxiety to excitement because they're very similar but for the narrative that we have in our head about it. Mm -hmm. So this diffusion technique, like I would say it's very useful with thoughts that as you said that you can bring it into feelings. So, so I'm aware of um, a feeling of anxiety. I'm aware of a feeling of excitement. I'm aware of any feeling at all, but not only that, then you can bring it into every other element of our experience. So all we ever experience is one of the following things is a thought, including memories, images, we'll throw dreams in there as well. A feeling, so anxiety, excitement, sadness, et cetera. A sensation, so a sensation of hunger or the sensation on the soles of your feet or anything like that. So Taste, the sensations smell, is, hearing, exactly. Yeah. Well, well, I was gonna say those are perceptions. So, oh, okay. yeah, so perception. So we, we experience the world through our five sense perceptions. So what we see, hear, taste, smell, touch. That right. makes up the entirety of our experience. Now, we, 
and you can, what you can do is actually, instead of thinking of it as a diffusion technique, but you can just start being, I'm aware of. Now, right now, I can see your face, Mark. I'm aware of the size of your face. In fact, I'm aware of the whole panoramic view of the visual field. I'm also, I'm aware of the feeling, the sensations of my bottom on the chair. I'm aware of the thoughts, what am I going to say next? Which other bit am I going to say? I'm aware of um, a slight taste in my mouth. I think we had dinner just before we came on. So every element of our experience, we're aware of it. So this aware presence is prior to every single experience uh, that we have. And so here's the big and important question, I think, is to question, okay, when we say I, or when we think of myself, what are we referring to? Because there is this sense that we've always been the same person throughout our life. I'm the same person now as I was a year ago, as I was 15, 25 years ago, the same experiencing. And yet, every, the, no one thought, feeling, sensation or perception has ever stayed in perpetuity. So what is it that gives us the certainty that we are the same person with a continuity? It can't be a thought or feeling, a sensation or a perception. In other words, it can't be the content of our experience. And it can't even be a physical cell in our body because, of course, they nope. regenerate every they week regenerate or two years or whatever. So got, e everything I've... about our experience and our physicality isn't what it was five years ago. Yeah, Exactly. It's always changing. And, and, it, and even with our body, we perceive our body. We experience our body. I experience my hand. I experience my body through sensations and perceiving it. I can see my face. I don't normally see it unless I'm in front of a mirror or something like that. Same with anyone. I'm just staring out of this empty space. Um, and so there is, we can't be a thought, a feeling, a sensation, a perception. And yet most people, if not all, the vast majority of people get their identity from the content of their experience, from a mixture of thoughts, feelings, sensations, etc. That is who I am. We identify with these things rather than the context, which is what is aware of all these things. What is aware of our thoughts, our feelings, our sensations, our perceptions? And there is an aware presence, an awareness, a consciousness that is there prior to all these things. But we overlook it because unlike everything that we're aware of, it is not a thing. You can't point and say, oh, there's this aware presence. And yet at the same time, it's utterly undeniable. It's the space in what thoughts, feelings, sensations, and perceptions arise in. There's something quite deep and profound and mysterious about this idea because it, it sort of challenges our whole nation, notion of identity and experience. And I personally find it quite liberating because it takes quite a lot of that pressure of what, what is supposed to be happening and how am I supposed to be and just says, it's sort of saying, what is, is, and that's all we ever really have, is what is, you know, happening that we can be aware of in any given moment. And that brings, I think, a sense of freedom. But what have you found in your own life about what that, having had that realization, how has that changed your day to day? You know, you have a young family, you have a busy job, uh -huh. <laughs> you know, talk us yeah. through that. Um, okay, so th I think the, the first thing is to, to is, it, if I talk about it more broadly and then I'll bring it to myself is to um, be to recognize there is this aware presence. Like I said, when I had that acceptance and commitment, you know, talk where the guy was like thinking mind and aware mind, I was oblivious to it. But if we can just recognize, no, there is something that is aware right now. You can ask yourself, am I aware of what I can see? Am I aware of the sound of my voice? The answer has to be yes. So if we take away sounds, sights, perceptions, whatever, there's still something that is continually there and aware. So that is, you know, part number one. And I think what happens then is the more that you become aware of the fact that you are aware, being aware of being aware, it rises from the background to the foreground of experience. Now, what I would say is this, um, imagine um, on a day, you've got something planned like a, a picnic and the weather forecast was good and you wake up and you're all excited about this picnic and you've got big plans and you pull back the curtains and it's hacking it down with rain. Now for a split second, you're just aware that it's raining. And then the thoughts rush in going, oh no, the day's ruined. What about my hair, my shoes? Oh my God, we're gonna have to think of something else. And that's when the panic and everything else sets in. So it, what we could say is 
the part, the aware mind, awareness, consciousness, whatever you want to call it, is totally accepting and at ease with what is always. It can't resist anything. It has no agenda with any elements of experience, but it's our thoughts that come in and go, I like this. I don't like this. Oh no, what about the rain? And so on and so forth. And then if you come back to flow, for example, then when we don't have those thoughts, we're so at, e we're so at one with what is that it's like the, the ex being the experiencer and the experience, the, the boundary between that dissolves. So what I would say for me is, is I have just increasingly, uh, first of all, I find this fascinating. Um, like for me, having ever since that sentence, I've just become more and more interested in it. So when I walk or at any time throughout the day, I will regularly just notice that there is something that is aware. So I know, Mark, for example, that you are uh, really into mindfulness, as am I. I still um, do mindfulness of breath. I find it very calming. I find it very good for my focus and concentration, all those things. But when I walk around, what I, you, if you notice, oh, the mindfulness of, let's say, sounds. I was walking across um, the bridge uh, to Waterloo Station recently, and Big Ben was away to my right, and the, the bongs were ringing. And um, you can be aware of the sounds, and then, but then you can be aware of that there's something that is aware of those sounds. So it's, it's a step beyond mindfulness. It's being aware of being aware. And it just goes from the background to the foreground of experience. And it, because it, there's no resistance in it, it's open, it's accepting. What I find is it increasingly um, pervades your experience. So the peace and sort of acceptance and quiet joy, it's not some massive ecstatic thing, just increasingly pervades your being. But there are also implications to it because let's say you've got human being, okay? The word's human being. Well, on the human side, we're all individual. There's only one Simon, there's only one Mark, as, as same as every other seven, eight billion, whatever there are on the planet. We've all got our own thoughts, feelings, sensations, experiences, relationships, blah, blah, blah. So we're all unique and that's obviously needs honoring. But on this other level of, of this aware presence that's prior to our thoughts and feelings and sensations and perceptions, et cetera, we're not. We're the same because all you can say about it is that I am, I exist, and I'm aware. You can't turn this. Oh, you can't turn this awareness up. You can't turn this awareness down. You can't turn it off. You can hold your breath. Try holding your awareness. You'll never do it. And on this level, we are the same. And so, what I would say is, the implications then are more peace and and general ease and flow on the inside. But also on the and I would say confident humility, because, you know, you're no better on this level. You're no better or worse than anyone else. But also, I would say then the golden rule, do unto others as as you want them to do unto you or love thy neighbor like thyself. Well, the implication of this recognition is that that is an inevitable follow, um, inevitable thing that just naturally starts to happen because you recognize that on this level, at this deepest level, it, if you are cruel, unkind, hurtful to your neighbor, metaphorically speaking, then you're also doing that to yourself at this deep level. And so I think it, it's, it, this understanding, this recognition does the heavy lifting for you in that it increases empathy and kindness on the outside and peace on the inside. And that's certainly been my experience. But then also just to add, you know, I, as I said, mine was suffering when I was starting out. So I had real problems with shame, insecurity, all those things. Well, now I'm not, this, those patterns are still there. But when, for example, a, a feeling of shame now arises, instead of being like, oh, I don't want to feel this. It's like, oh no, allow this to come up. And it's there in this aware presence. And it's allowed to then just dissolve. I'm not identifying with the content of this awareness. No, I'm not resisting the shame. And therefore, I'm sort of befriending and welcoming the shame and, and it, re recognizing it's not who I am and it dissipates on its own. So it has implications for how we are inside and how we treat others outside. I would even go so far as to say, I think personally, this recognition literally could change the world. Because I think that right now we are we act so separate, we act so se we're so tribal. The other, you know, oh, I'm British, you're this, or all those kind of things, those tribal allegiances. Whereas this, on this level, we are all the same, and therefore 
the onus is on us to behave in accordance with that recognition. I almost can't express how much I love that point. Um, as you know, the, the sort of words we use with action for happiness are happier, kinder, together, recognizing that our own well-being and the well-being of others are so intrinsically related and that the best way to pursue either and both is together. But you've given us a really lovely practical kind of universal way of being and existing that is both a way to inner peace and a way to potentially to outer peace as well. So I think that's really um, uplifting, actually. So very grateful for that. But I wonder, could we, in the spirit of action for happiness, maybe take a moment just to cultivate a little bit of this uh, for ourselves and for the community. So wherever you are right now in the world, just take a moment to pause and without going into i'm not going to take us into some kind of deep meditation thing because i think the key point simon's making here is this is something we can try and bring in any moment but what right now for you what is one answer to i'm aware that dot 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 so it might be that you're aware of something simon said or something you're feeling or um you know uh, a, a taste or a sound or a a, a thought emotion if you'd like to just share in a few words in the chat something that you're aware of let's cultivate this idea of being aware first so yeah. i'll just see a few of the things and, that and can up. i can so, i just add something yeah, to that please. which is mark that is that you can't have an experience and not be aware of it it's impossible so awareness is is everywhere it's constant because because it's it, they, you if you took awareness away from any experience the experience couldn't stand i could hold this pen up and I could remove the pen, the awareness would stand. If I remove the awareness, there would be no experience of the pen. So everything that we experience, thought, feeling, sensation, perception, everything has to be pervaded by this aware presence. So, so we're doing this all the time, but we don't often cultivate the awareness of the awareness. Yeah. And so people here are saying that they're aware of uh, feeling of anxiety in the stomach, uh, they're back in the chair, being grateful for a home cooked meal, aware of my dog on my lap, the thought that my son is unhappy, the aftertaste of coffee, the lo the, the see seeing the lava lamp bubbling, feeling overheated, feeling peace, aware that the sun is rising and uh, aware of feeling sleepy and lots and lots of other examples. And what I love here is you've created a way of us um, experiencing the world that unites so many of the different things that we sometimes think of as separate thoughts, feelings, senses, that actually it's all just a version of awareness. Is that right? Yes. And some, I, I saw one comment pop up, which was like, could, could awareness be an illusion? No, I would say uh, awareness is the only thing that couldn't be an illusion. It, it, the fact that we're conscious is the only thing that couldn't be an illusion. What we see we know that we don't see reality as it is. We see reality in order to survive. That's evolutionary game theory. Um, we don't see things as they are. But the fact that we experience things, that is undeniable. So, so yeah. And, and also, there's a slight difference between attention and awareness. So we can put our attention on something. So if everyone put their attention on your face right now, Mark, and then all of a sudden you notice the, the sensations on the soles of your feet. Now that you were aware of the sensations on the soles of your feet, you just didn't know that you were aware. So this is why when we're, when we're dreaming, we're often having an experience, but we don't know that we're dreaming. We don't know that we're having an experience. This is the difference between phenomenal consciousness and uh, meta consciousness. So just to say that, you know, attention is awareness on an object. Awareness is, is the background, you know, that is always there. It's the, it's, it's the background to every element of experience. Thank you. And thank you all for participating in this. In a moment, I want to come to questions from the audience. So if you have a question for Simon, please do use the Q&A function. And if you see a question you like, please give it a thumbs up and we'll come to the most popular questions at the top of the list. But before we go there, I just wanted to sort of go a little bit deeper on this um, really profound idea that there's a sense of connection between all of us. And one of the really strong I guess, values in this community isn't just about the self-care and self-help aspect of happiness. It's yeah. about the creating a happier world, sort of altruistic intent. Um, I think many of us are surrounded by people who are not behaving in ways that, that are fully in touch with their own awareness and living mindfully and experiencing flow. There's a lot of anxiety and uncertainty. And, and so however much we cultivate this in ourselves and see it in others, there's also a, 
a desire for others to experience this that's quite hard you know unless somebody is choosing to hear what you're saying they're, they're they're sort of on autopilot rather than what you might call this more conscious way of living yeah. is there a way you found of modeling this or bringing this so that it has these ripple effects to others around us rather than just being something that we might intellectually tell to someone who's really struggling but that does have no help to them how can we how can we exhibit this in a way that spreads, I guess, is what I'm asking. Um, yeah, I, I understand that. I think this can be really, dif it can be difficult to grasp. But it can be frustrating because I think we're so um, identified with thoughts and the thinking mind. It, it's got such a habit and momentum to it mm. that it, it can be frustrating. Um, I would say for me, ACT um, was a really powerful way in, you know, that diffusion technique um, and... And but what I find that once you've made this recognition that I'm aware, or there is this aware mind or their awareness, and you just start to notice it. And, and, and I saw someone pop up, how do you be aware of being aware? You can't be aware of being aware as an object. So right now I can be aware of this pen because it's at a distance to me, but you can only be aware so you can only know that you are aware so if you said to yourself right am i am i aware of the sound of simon's voice well you'd have to answer yes if you said am i aware of the sight of the screen well you'd have to answer yes then all you stop is go am i aware and you have to say yes and that doesn't mean that there's something that we can experience objectively that um you know that we can find out there like a thing the, to latch onto. And that is so frustrating for the mind. That's so frustrating for the mind because we're so used to putting our attention on things. So for example, in meditation, we put it on the breath or a, or a mantra or anything like that. But if we can just notice that it's very subtle, the more that you pay, just, just quite ask yourself, am I, am I aware? Or try and just be aware of if when you're next aware of some sounds, oh, what is it that's aware of that? It will just rise from the background to the foreground more. One of my guests put it really beautifully. It goes from invisible to subtle to obvious. And, and also you said something earlier, by the way, um, Mark, that I just want to say is it about our awareness or my awareness. See, you could even question that and say it, whether or not it is our or my, or whether it's just, um, it's just the nature of reality at large which is so hence that lack of lack of separation i'm potentially going a little deep here um but you know in our experience everything arises in awareness um we tend to think that there's the world and then there's awareness within it but actually in our experience awareness is there first and then the world and my body and thoughts and all those things arise in it um but in just in in terms of the simple thing, I don't think you, for me personally, I don't think you can go wrong with ACT. And then there's lots of things you can read around this. And there are lots of people who I would suggest, you know, speaking to. And, and it's just a sort of realignment because it's a completely different way of understanding ourself, the way we operate, reality at large, that, you know, you can't expect to just get it or, or to recognize it like that. But it is about sowing the seed and letting it, letting it, blossom and for me that was as simple as i'm aware of the thought that noticing that, that i wasn't my thought i was aware of it and then it's just grown and grown and continues to grow and i hope it will never stop growing and i think what you've given us there simon is a really practical tool actually so i'm aware of or i'm aware of the thought that or the feeling that or the sensation that is just something we can use in any situation just to slightly give us space. Mm. Somebody was asking about how would this apply in a panic attack? And obviously that's a very um, you know, extreme example of, a, of an overwhelm. And yet perhaps if we can in that kind of moment say, I'm aware of the fact that I'm feeling on edge, panicky right now, even in that moment, that creates a little bit of space to not feel completely caught up in it. Can I, um, can I just say something on that? Because actually I've been through this experience myself. Right. Um, I overdosed on coffee. I had uh, eight espressos uh, stupidly without realizing it and, and basically had a panic attack. And how I dealt with it, it was not fun, but I went, I, I went right into the present and then I just wrote down everything that I was aware of. So I was just like, okay, right now I'm aware of the sensation in my stomach. I'm aware of this thought. I'm aware of 
the, everything that was coming into everything I was aware of. So I was just continually bringing myself back to, I'm aware of X, I'm aware of X, whatever it was. And just doing that and doing that and doing that and doing that just to root myself into the present rather than trying to escape your experience, which is what the mind always does, takes you into the future. Oh my God, this is going to happen in the future, catastrophizing or anything like that. What are you aware of? I know, eight espressos, John, it was awful. Um, uh, and, uh, but, but, and that helped me to just stay present and, and then let it pass, basically, yeah. Simon, we're running out of time, but um, there's some great questions. Uh, Tara has just said, or asked, how do you stay in flow, something we mentioned earlier, when you feel constantly pulled in many different directions in different roles, for example, as a mother or a colleague or a daughter or a sister, wife, etc.? Um, you know, I guess we've talked about the experience of flow. We haven't really talked about how we can find ways to have more of it in our busy lives. Well, first of all, I, I do think there there's value in finding our own personal ways into flow. As I said, for me, it's very different to my wife. My wife loves playing piano. Um, um, you know, for me, it's watching Roger Federer playing tennis, reading conversation, these kind of these kind of things. So there are ways into it. I also think you don't want to set up an unrealistic expectation that you're always going to be in this state. You know, I have I have two kids, uh, including a baby. And, you know, I, I'm stressed and I often lose touch with this. But I think you can always touch back into this at will. And particularly the more you do, it's a bit like meditation when you practice you, you, it becomes more familiar. It becomes easier. The more that you can ask yourself, what, oh, am I aware? What is it that's aware of what I can hear? What is it that's aware of what, of my thoughts? Bringing yourself back to that, the more that it becomes, it, it rises again from the background to the foreground. And so it, it, it does it, it does take a bit of time, but it's always, always available under any circumstances. That's the beauty of it. Mm. Uh, Natalie's asked about those diffusion techniques you were referring to, like the I'm aware of. Can that also apply to physical symptoms? For example, she says nausea or motion sickness. Uh, yeah. Um, the thing is, I would say that it's not necessarily about trying to get rid of the feelings. This is, this is an important thing. It's about being interested in them and welcoming them. Because part of the thing about, let's say, motion sickness or pain is our resistance to them, is our wanting to get rid of them. And so actually, uh, if I sometimes have a pain or, um, yeah, let's stay with the pain. If you actually drop the narrative about the pain, the story that you tell about the pain and go directly to the raw sensation and sort of inquire into it, you know, it's just this, typically this, this kind of amorphous tingly sensation in this aware space. And then it actually becomes really interesting. Uh, as one of my guests said, the what did he say he said um the uh the the some what's the, uh, the the medicine is in the poison that's the thing um so yeah i think when we have things that we're dis we that we find uncomfortable is actually to become interested in it and welcome them so with my eldest daughter we we play a feelings game and she's always um she'll say to me oh, i'm worried about going to school or whatever and i'm okay first of all where are you now OK, well, you're in your bedroom. You're safe. Fine. Can you welcome these thoughts and these feelings? And she's actually done this thing. She has a little tea party for her feelings and and she's got very good at it. And I'm like, I can't believe you. You know this at the age of nine. I was way older than my. So lovely. I it, yeah, honestly, it's it, it. And she she shared it with some of her. She was doing a dance recital. One of the girls was really she was like, I've got a tummy ache. She goes, oh, I think you're nervous. Welcome the feeling. Um, and so the more you can become interested in these things and stop battling and resisting them, it won't take away the pain, but it will take away, as they say in Buddhism, the second arrow, the resistance to the pain, and the pain can therefore have a different quality to it. This relinks to Ilona's question, which is why do our thoughts sometimes, or in fact she said in her case, most of the time run towards negatives? Um, she says, I'm happy one minute, but then I'll find something negative about it, which will knock me down again. And I, I guess part of the answer to that is just to notice I'm aware of the fact that I have found something negative about this feeling. And it's just well, a sort of, you know, it's, it's not about saying I mustn't feel this. It's about sort of saying I'm aware that I'm, this is what's coming up for me right now. 
and it passes. Yes. Is that kind of how you'd respond to that? Well, I think, um, first of all, is this idea of, oh, I, negative thinking is, is a bad thing. Negative thinking is, um, is part of the sort of the operating software of the brain. Like the brain is designed to keep us alive and therefore it's going to have, it's known to have a negativity bias. It's on the lookout for danger. It's on the lookout for things that could go wrong. Because back in the day, obviously, it was the saber-toothed tiger. We do, it doesn't know that nowadays, you know, it's emails and this, that, and the other. You know, we're not literally, um, you know, a risk of dying, but our brain doesn't know that. So we have a negativity bias. More negative thoughts typically are going to come up than positive. And the thing is, if you're aware of a thought and can say, oh, a thought is a thought irrespective of its content, then it doesn't matter if it's saying this is going to be bad or this is going to be great. It's just a thought. It doesn't actually matter what the content is. And I think a lot of people, and I used to do this, would spend a lot of time trying to change a negative thought into a positive thought. If you just notice it's a thought, it doesn't matter what it's saying. It's like the annoying kid in the back of your car going, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Just let it chirp on. And, uh, you know, and, and it doesn't have to, uh, to impact you. If you can recognize it's a thought, it does not have to impact you, whatever it's saying. Mm, that's a really practical way of thinking about it. Um, I'm going to suggest that we wrap here because we're, we're running out of time. In a moment, I'd love to come back to you for a final thought, Simon. But um, what I'd love us to do just for a moment, all of us, wherever you are in the world right now, is to take a moment to do what we call the check out with Action for Happiness. So maybe just take a moment wherever you are in the world and just if you'd like to close your eyes, you're welcome to. We'll just take a, a deep breath and just no notice what's going on. Be aware to use Simon's language of what what's going on for you right here right now and perhaps intentionally now draw to mind something that you're feeling grateful for or something that you're going to take away from this session maybe an insight that's come up this idea of diffusion this idea of cultivating flow just bring your attention to something that you'd like to take away from this really important time we spent with simon and then keeping that in mind that appreciation that gratitude the last part of our checkout is just to remember that there are so many people all around the world that could use more happiness in their lives right now. So keeping that sense of awareness, of mindfulness, of compassion, of well-wishing, let's send out some of that to where that's needed in the world right now for those people that aren't perhaps lucky enough to be able to join someone like this or have access to this wisdom. So many more people could do with this vital life skill to be aware and to be able to let um, let things be, um, whatever's going on for them. As we remember that Action for Happiness pledged to create more happiness and unha less unhappiness in the world. And I think you've given us a really vital sort of base level way of experiencing that is fundamental to all of that, whether it's our own well-being or how we are with others, Simon. So thank you, first of all, for your time and your work and for the great book, which I've been really enjoying. But Maybe over to you for the last word. What's the sort of way you'd like to wrap this up? What's your final message to us today? Um, what I'd like to say is that, you know, we are human beings. And so on the one hand, yes, we are individual, unique and separate. And what a privilege and a, and a gift that is. And acceptance very much comes into that. But we overlook this being side. The fact that, you know, we are life animating as Simon and Mark and everyone else right now. And the more that we can become aware of this, this consciousness, this, this awareness, this being, um, then we have, we're, we're touching on both sides. And I think that that is so powerful. And on that being side, we are connected. And I hope that then that can spill out into the way we treat others, animals and the world. And, you know, it could have a ripple effect that could have a profound impact on on the planet because I would suggest it it seems like it needs it at least. Well you've certainly had a real impact on me for your work and I think on all of us here today with the insights that you've shared so we're very grateful to you Simon keep up the inspiring work the great podcast we'll send man tomorrow to everyone who's been involved in this a link to the video to your resources like the book and so on but um, just remains to say a big thanks again for being here to all of you but particularly to you Simon. Thank you so much. It's been a really real privilege. Thanks, Mark.